Okay, uh, well, looks like we're just a little past three, so I'd like to call the August 17th, 2020 Longmont Water Board meeting to order. Could we please start with the roll call? Todd Williams? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Renee Davis? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Uh, city staff, we have Ken Hewson. Here. Nelson Tipton. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Heather McIntyre is here. David Bell. Here. Francie Jaffe. Here. Jason Elkins. Here. And then we have guests with us today, Larry Wayno. Becky Doyle. Here. And Danielle Levine. Here. And Jennifer Loper. Here. And then do we have Council Member Martin with us? Oh, there she is. She just joined. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda will be election of officers. So I'd like to ask the board for nominations um, for chairman of the upcoming water board year. Kathy. I, I'd like to nominate um, Todd Williams as uh, chair again, since he's doing such a good job. <laughs> Are there any other nominations? All right, well, hearing none, I'll close the nominations and I'll ask for a vote of the current water board members um, for Todd Williams to be the 2020-2021 water board chairman. If you could please um, state by saying aye in confirmation of that. I need a second first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess I do. Thank you. Do I All have a second? second? All second. All right. Thank you. All right, with that, I'd like to take a, take the vote. All in favor of Todd Williams being the 2020-2021 uh, chairman for the Longmont Water Board, signal by saying aye. 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 Um, any opposed, same sign? Don't believe we had any. What I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Todd to have the election for the vice chair. Wes, um, I guess a couple of notes before we do that. One, I want to welcome Allison. Welcome to the your first water board meeting. I wish it was in person, but this is about all we can do in, <laughs> in the current state of things. So welcome to your first water board meeting. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored. Thanks. And then the, the second thing I wanted to mention is um, I had talked to Renee um, Davis, and I think she wanted to um, kind of make an announcement before we, we um, nominate the vice chair. So go ahead, Renee, when you're ready. Uh, yes. So um, things have changed for me, and I have moved to Lafayette. I am technically still a legal resident of Longmont uh, through the end of the month, but after that, I'm not. So I need to resign from Waterboard. So bye. What's the date, Renee? What's the date yeah. that I leave? Yeah. August 31st. Okay. Well, sorry to see you go. Yeah, it's a bummer, but it's okay. And, and I just wanted to reiterate, I, Renee has been a great resource for the board, and thank you for all your, your time and effort. So we're, oh, we're definitely sad to see you go. I've, I've learned so much from you guys. It's been great. Thanks again. Um, I guess with that, um, we need to uh, make a nomination for the vice chair, which um, I think, I believe I can, Wes, can I make that nomination? Yeah, as the chairman, you can. Okay, I'd like to nominate Kathy Peterson to be the vice chair of the, the water board. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Kathy. And you got big shoes to fill. So. I know. <laughs> <clears throat> so with that, um, we're on to approval of the, uh, and maybe before I get to number four there, I wanted to bring up one item. Um, in talking to Wes and um, Ken, it sounds like the replacement for Renee's position may, um, according to the city clerk's office, may be waiting until December. Um, for applications. And I didn't know, you know, obviously Allison um, is very qualified. I didn't know if there's any other very qualified applicants. And Marcia, would there be a possibility given all we've got going on of maybe trying to use one of the prior applicants to fill Renee's seat? Or is that a possibility or not? And we can talk about this later in the meeting if need be. I was just thinking about it um, at this point. Um the answer is we did have some other qualified applicants. Um, we, um, the most qualified other applicant, uh, there was concern about a conflict of interest because he represents uh, uh, other water litigants inside Longmont. Um, but and I would have to, I'd have to look at the other applicants and see, um, and and maybe have a discussion about the one applicant who was also a water attorney. Um, mm. But uh, I also don't understand how the process works, so I don't know whether there's any possibility of appointing someone in advance. I'll, but I'm happy to take that and consult with the city clerk about it. If, if you could, my understanding is it wouldn't be until December until it'd be posted. And my concern is we've, we've got a lot of, kind of important items to discuss. And if it's you know five or six months before we could seat that missing position on the water board if there's a way to do it earlier I think the earlier the better so someone could get up to speed on the issues so I'd, I'd appreciate if you could do that Marsh and then let us know yep. what can will, be done in that regard I'll do that today awesome thank you very much um, with that um, we're on to item number four which is approval of the previous month's minutes for July 20th of 2020 did any of the board have any questions comments on those minutes if not, we need a motion to approve um, those minutes. So move. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Okay, motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. Um, next item, number five, is the water status report. Wes, yes. who's, are you giving that today? I'll give that today. The uh, flow of the St. Brain at Lyons at 8 a.m. this morning was 55.6 CFS. Uh, the 124-year average was 120.28 CFS, so about half. Um, the call on the St. Brain is Longmont Supply with an admin of 5,600 or May 1st, 1865 as the priority date. Calling the main stem of the South Platte is Lower Latham with an admin of 11,670. 11, so that is a appropriation date of October 24th, 1881. The uh, Button Rock is spilling and we are releasing 35 CFS. Union is at 26.6 feet, so it's down about 2.4 feet, or just a little under 1,000 acre feet. And that's all I have. Thank you, Wes. Is there any questions, comments for Wes on the water status report? Okay, thank you for the report, Wes. Um, item six is public invited to be heard and special presentations. Um, I guess to start with, do we have any special presentations today, Ken or Wes? We do have a special presentation. Do you want to do the public invited to be heard first or do you want yes. to do a presentation? No, okay. we can do public invited to be heard. 
I know Gaithia wants to um, wanted to address us. Was there anyone else, or just Gaithia today? She's the only one that I see on the call. So. Okay. Well, welcome, Gaithia. I'm glad you could make it today. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, first of all, if you could state your name and address for the record, and then secondly, I'll try to time it here, but we have a three minute um, kind of time limit. I think they let you know before the meeting. So whenever you're ready, um, go ahead and you've got the floor. Okay. My name is Gaithia Weiss and I live at 1433 Cannon Mountain Drive in Longmont and I'm a retired analytical chemist. Uh, and I am just speaking today because I wanted to raise awareness of a July 2020 report to the Colorado Water Conservation Board entitled Colorado's Demand Management Feasibility Investigation Update. And this uh, has to do with the Colorado, Colorado River Basin and it calls for temporary voluntary and compensated reduction in consumptive use of that water. Uh, and the purpose of this is to increase storage in Lake Powell, and that all has to do with the Colorado Compact of 1920 and what Del Carpenter agreed to uh, with deep concern that if the Col Lake Powell disappears in, as a storage, then there are some huge consequences for the upper basin, including Colorado, in terms of what has to be delivered downstream anyway. Um, so the issue as I see it has to do with climate change, increasing aridity in this area, and what all of that means for the viability of our Windy Gap junior water rights. And I'm not an expert, I'm just basically raising that concern today. I can send a link to the full report, which is like 200 pages long, but does have an executive summary. Um, to Heather to distribute to the group. And there is a public comment section coming up, or at least a public one. I don't know how you guys qualify as public or they have some, they have some special conduit. Anyway, that's the public one is August 26th, just coming right up. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gaithia. And yeah, if you could send that to Heather and uh, Heather, if you could maybe send that link out to the rest of the board. I sure uh, can do that. That'd be great. Great. Well, thank you for your comment today, Gaithia. I appreciate that. Um, was there anyone that was it, Heather? And then we'll be on to the special presentations. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Who's handling the special presentation? Ken, were you going to introduce that? Um, yeah. Um, what we wanted to do was present um, some of the information on the um, upcoming uh, bond election, uh, which may occur this fall if uh, well, City Council sets that as a bond issue. Um, we have a, a number of large capital projects due in the water operating uh, fund and construction funds. Uh, primarily, the biggest one is an enlargement of the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. Um, probably secondarily is, is, is a replacement for some of our treated water storage tanks. Um, we have uh, Becky and Barb are on the call today to, to give you a kind of the rundown on, on the bond and um, some of the facts about the, the issue, the question that will go before the public. And so I, I believe Becky was going to do the presentation. I think you get Larry actually. <laughs> okay, Larry, we get Larry. That's that's even better. He's Larry is is in our engineering department and is the project manager for the enlargement uh, of the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. And so, yeah, you get the real good technical details from Larry. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Larry. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Larry Wino. I work in Public Works and Natural Resources. I'm a engineering administrator. Our engineering group uh, manages all the water and wastewater infrastructure for the city. Uh, so we do want to talk to you about the bond, uh, water bond election that is being proposed for this, uh, this fall. Uh, Becky will probably uh, jump in during some of this uh, presentation because uh, she can fill you in on the details of the actual financing and the bonds better than I can. 
I think there is a short, uh, what we've done is we've prepared a PowerPoint presentation and a video that we are gonna be presenting to the public to educate them about this bond election. So I think uh, Heather is gonna run that and we'll start out with the uh, video. I think after that, we will do a short PowerPoint presentation. And since we don't have a lot of, a large group here, uh, it may be more efficient as we do the slides. If you do have questions, just uh, holler or raise your hand and we can try to uh, answer your questions as we go through the slides. So can we start that? Heather, we don't have volume on this. You don't have volume? No, we're not hearing my beautiful voice. Um, there should be a button as you get ready to share it. Of course, you probably know that because you've probably done it a hundred times. But. Hold on one second. Ah, oh, share computer sound, that probably helps, huh? Sorry guys, let's try that again. The City Council may submit a question to voters on the November ballot asking for approval to issue $80 million in water bonds to finance the renewal of aging water infrastructure and maintain system reliability and quality. These are critical citywide system improvements that benefit water customers today and into the future. A clean, safe, and reliable drinking water supply is always critical. It's of particular importance during times of emergency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Longmont's water is clean primarily because it comes from a very pristine source within Rocky Mountain National Park. That clean water is then stored in Ralph Price Reservoir, which is surrounded by the 3,500-acre Button Rock Preserve in the mountains west of Longmont to be ready for the community's use throughout the year. After the water leaves Ralph Price Reservoir, it is delivered to our two treatment facilities. Nelson Flanders Treatment Plant, which is the primary treatment plant for the city, as well as the Wade Gaddis Treatment Plant, which is really used in an emergency basis and for backups when necessary. The city's Wade Gaddis Water Treatment Plant was uh, placed in service in 1983. Uh, that plant now is reaching the end of its life cycle and the capacity that it currently provides will have to be replaced. The city recently conducted some engineering studies to determine what's the best way to replace that capacity. We had the choice of either replacing Wade Gaddis or expanding our Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant and the, the best option, at least cost for us, is to expand the Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant, which was placed in service in about 2005. Fortunately, that plant was actually constructed with expansion in mind, so that makes it really an efficient option for us. In addition to expanding the Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant, there are other planned upgrades in the potable water treatment system over the next couple of years. This includes potable water tanks that are aging now and have reached their life cycle, and miles of pipe that will also need to be replaced. In 2019, the City Council approved a five-year rate schedule that contemplated selling bonds to spread out the costs to upgrade Longmont's aging water infrastructure over several years. That rate schedule supports issuing up to $80 million in water bonds. Without voter approval to issue the water bonds, needed projects could be delayed and system reliability affected. Think of water bonds like taking out a mortgage on a house. Paying for improvements with water bonds helps acquire needed assets and infrastructure repairs now, while spreading out the cost of those improvements over time to avoid rate spikes. This keeps rates more predictable for users. Using water bonds to finance the infrastructure improvements also results in user rates that are initially lower than if cash were used to fund the improvements. 
This spreads out the cost of these upgrades more equitably across both current and future water customers. These are all considerations to keep in mind when voting. Here are some reasons why a voter might be in favor of this funding request. And here are some reasons why a voter might be against this funding request. A yes vote would allow the City of Longmont to issue $80 million in water bonds to be used along with existing fund balances and adopted rate increases toward renewing aging water infrastructure and maintaining system reliability and quality. A no vote would mean bonds would not be issued. Adopted rate increases would still take place. Those rate increases, plus existing cash balances, could be used toward renewal projects, but other funding sources would need to be found. The safety and reliability of Longmont's drinking water is essential to our community. We ask you to spend some time researching the issues, ask questions if you have them, and most importantly, come out and vote. 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 Learn more about the water bond issue at longmontcolorado.gov slash water hyphen bonds. Election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. So, oh, yep. You so can go ahead. There, go ahead and there, talk, Larry, while I pull up the. Oh, okay. So, was I think there may have been a question, uh, Councilwoman Martin. Thank you, Larry. Um, I just this is very nice job, by the way. I I like it a lot. Um, I wanted to know where this is going to be aired, how many different places, how often, um, all that stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, we've suffered in the past from not getting the message out enough, and I want to make sure that this message gets out enough. Yeah, I know our communications uh, people have been uh, scheduling um, to present this to other groups in the in the city, uh, I don't have the exact number, but they are planning on doing it uh, throughout the, the month of August. So uh, that's something we can uh, follow up on and let you know if uh, you would like like us to do that. Uh, Becky, will it be on Channel Eight and on YouTube so that people can share it? Skull, I think, but anybody, any Becky who knows may answer. Oh, Jen Jennifer's, I think, coming back into the meeting. Sorry, but yes, I, can't. I, I oh. couldn't unmute. <laughs> but if Jennifer is able to unmute, she's got the latest on that and um, she'd be best. Otherwise, I can tell you what I know. Jennifer's coming back online right now. Hi there. Sorry, my, my next light -like connection kicked me out. I think it was my husband's fault. <laughs> so, Jennifer, there's a question. Council Member Martin was wondering how yes. we're getting this video message out to everyone and where it's posted so people can um, see it. Absolutely. No, that's a great question, Council Member Martin. Um, so, we are doing several, um, following several options and paths for getting this messaging out. Um, we're doing community presentations like this one. Uh, we've presented to a couple of groups so far. We have a handful more scheduled coming up. Um, sorry, I guess I could turn my camera on and then you guys could see me instead of just being a disembodied voice. Um, and then we have a dedicated web page that has the video on it along with some information about the water bonds ballot issue. Um, we also have started a series of social media posts, which will send people both to that web page and then sometimes give them um, a little snippet of the video as well. Um, and then we're also looking at doing possibly like something like a Facebook Live, where we can invite members of the community to come and watch it and hear the presentation and then you know type in their questions. So. So uh, part of my question that you didn't get to hear because you were kicked off 
was, is it going to be aired on channel eight and 880 and is it going to be on the YouTube channel for yes. uh, Longmont Public Media? Yes, it is on the YouTube channel. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. And yes, I do plan also to work with LPM to get it on um, the, uh, the public access channels. Yes, yes, all of those things. And any other suggestions you have, I'm happy to hear. That's just the suggestion I always make. Hey, it's a good one. It's a good one. Use our resources. Thank you. Roger, go ahead. Oh, Roger, is that question for me? I don't know. Oh, Todd. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, it is for you, Jennifer. <laughs> uh, you know, the typical thing the public thinks about is when they're voting for a bond issue is the question always gets asked, whether they understand it or not, will the rates go up if I vote for it? And uh, as I uh, watch what uh, Larry put on there, the rates will stay, the rate increases will be the rate increases regardless if this bond issue is approved or not approved. Is that correct? I'm gonna let Becky Doyle explain that one. She, uh, she's our numbers lady. Hello, I'm Becky Doyle. Um, yes, yes. So we, so council has adopted a five year rate schedule that it includes, you know, that contemplates the issuing of these bonds. And so I would say, yeah, the rate, the rates are the rates. They're already adopted. Um, and those changes will take place. Um, I, I think that potentially without the passage of this issue, you, we may have to revisit, um, I mean, because something has to move, move, whether it's, you know, either rescheduling projects or um, then, you know, raising additional funding through, uh, through rate increases at that point. All I'm saying is, you know, I think we ought to be very clear about the fact that rates will not automatically go up because of approval of the bond issue. That, that's not my statement, unless I'm reading it wrong, because if people understand the rates are the rates, regardless if the bond issue goes through or not, I think that would be a, a positive, uh, outcome of approving the bonds. Uh, that's the way I look at it, unless somebody can tell me differently, but uh, just make sure that, you know, when this information goes out, especially wherever you're putting out, people understand that situation. Yes, I think that's a key message. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? I don't see any. Larry, do you wanna keep, oh, I'm sorry, Marcia, did you have one? Um, yeah, this is, a, and I should know this because I already voted to approve it. I put it on the ballot, but um, uh, does the language of the res of that will be on the ballot say without raising your water water rates? That's something I should know too, and I will look that up while Larry goes through the PowerPoint. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Larry, if you want to do your part, oh. go ahead. Uh, I had just, uh, just so that people don't feel like we're trying to pull something over on them, I think we need to um, make sure that we preface that with saying there are, are already scheduled uh, rate increases or rates over the next five years and that voting for this will not increase it. It's not that you'll never have a rate increase, you know, because we're going to have rate increases. And maybe even, I don't know if you feel comfortable saying that, but if we, if this doesn't pass, it's been said that it'll even out the effect on rates, that the effect on rates would be more uh, dramatic, actually. So. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Kathy. Um, Yes, uh, the, the passage of the bonds is part of the overall rate structure package that Council Member Martin and the other members of City Council voted for. And so there are structured rate increases over the next five years um, that have been designed to help pay back the bonds and their interest. But as you said, if, if the bonds aren't approved, then you have to find other funding. Other funding has to be found. You don't have to find it, but. <laughs> Roger, go ahead. I, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, Marcia, you, your language saying that the passage of this will not raise your water rates. If water rates are already scheduled, 
you know, somehow that that strikes me as uh, something that people would would challenge if, if you understand what I'm saying. The rates are going to increase, and that's the way it is. And to say they won't increase, I, I think that's uh, not well, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting language, Roger. I was just wanting to make sure that it that it. Uh, I was just curious as to whether we had said that the rate schedule was already fixed, which it does say in this video, um, and that your vote um, will not immediately, the passage or, or failure of, of this bond issue um, will not immediately affect rates. So um, yeah, it is, it is difficult to explain, but um, people should understand that it's not uh, a direct impact on their pocketbook and that, uh, and, and yeah, that, that having it fail is probably more likely to have an adverse impact on their bill than, than having it succeed. Well, and with the speaking point to it be something more like passage of this bond will help keep rate increases in the near term to a minimum. Um, you know, rather than no rate increases because they are scheduled, but say, hey, this is your trade off. It's between a small rate increase and a big rate increase. It's exactly if right. something happens. True. Yeah. Any other comments? All right, Larry, looks like we're ready for the presentation. All right, thanks. Uh, I think those are really, <coughs> really good comments. Uh, it is covered to some extent on the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And in fact, the presentation mentions a lot of things that were in the video, but I think uh, gives uh, the presentation probably does give an opportunity for those questions to be asked as we go out through all the, to the public, different uh, uh, citizen groups. Uh, we can try to make that clear as we're going through this presentation. Uh, so, uh, again, I think we're, we can go on to the next slide, uh, the next. So, uh, let me try to get my stuff in sync. So, the ballot issue for voter presentation or consideration, it, it is uh, something, again, that we will inform the uh, citizens that it was unanimously uh, passed by the city council at the August 11th meeting to uh, place this ballot issue on, uh, or ballot issue on the, the water bond issue on the ballot for November. Uh, and we do mention, and we will mention that the bonds are part of a five year rate structure increase that was adopted by council in 2019. Um, next slide. <clears throat> the reason for the putting the uh, bond on the ballot, uh, it is required by the city charter. Uh, again, uh, this bond will not uh, create any new taxes. It is not subject to the Tabor Amendment because there are no changes in taxes and also the water utility is a enterprise fund. So they are exempt from the Tabor. Uh, the water bond is needed to implement uh, several large uh, projects that we have identified uh, through previous master planning we've done. There was a plan that was done in 2013 and then a update of that uh, master plan in 2019. All the projects that we've identified that are high priority projects have been included in this bond election. The next slide. So why does the uh, city want to issue these bonds? Uh, again, uh, the bonds uh, by issuing bonds, we can control the rate increases on, uh, on the citizens uh, and keep them lower than what we have scheduled and what have already been adopted by the city. 
uh, in 2019. Uh, so if we can issue the bonds, the uh, rate increases that have been adop already adopted will not be impacted. The next slide. What will the, the bonds are really uh, our our effort to try to ma maintain the, the uh, efficiency and reliability of all of our water supply infrastructure uh, and to maintain the quality of water that we provide to the citizens. Uh, the, the largest and probably most significant project that is included in there is the Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant Expansion. Uh, again, it was constructed and started operation in uh, January 2006. Uh, it is the primary treatment plant for the city. It is operated year round. Uh, when we designed, planned and designed this plant, we actually had planned for expansion of this plant to 60 million gallons per day. And that was also included in our Boulder County permit. Uh, because we're outside the city uh, in unincorporated uh, Boulder County, we had to go through a activities of state interest permit or a, what is referred to as a 1041 permit. At that time, we actually included in that permit that uh, we would be able to expand the capacity of that plant up to 80, although we have anticipated that we will only need to get it up to 60 uh, in the future. Uh, that expansion is actually a little bit misleading because we're not actually expanding uh, total capacity of our system. We have two treatment plants. The Wade Gaddis water treatment plant is a plant that was built in 1983. Uh, it is really a standby treatment plant uh, but it has uh, experienced a lot of issues, primarily structural issues. It is an older plant. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But we are actually just replacing the capacity of that Wade Gaddis plant by expanding treatment at Nelson Flanders. There are other projects that we've identified through our master planning. Uh, the next highest priority project is uh, our 7 million gallon price part storage tank uh, located just north of Sunset Golf Course. Uh, the other, we have identified other projects that are high priority, but at this time we haven't uh, de determined the priority of those projects. We have uh, transmission lines. Uh, we've got storage tanks that need to be addressed over the next five to 10 year period. Uh, probably the, one of the bigger projects is also another storage tank, uh, Montgomery tank. It is a six million gallon tank. It was built in 1967. Uh, we also have transmission lines that we will need to address in the near future. Uh, one of them being the North St. Brain pipeline that brings water down from uh, Ralph Pice Reservoir. So uh, those projects will be uh, in addition to the Price Park in Nelson Flanders, will be looked at closer over the next year or two, and uh, we will make a decision on which ones will be the highest priority to implement in the near future. But definitely Nelson Flanders will be something we need to address uh, in the next year or two, if we can. The next slide. So talking a little bit more about the treatment plants. Uh, the current estimate uh, for expanding Nelson Flanders is around $40 million. We do have uh, cash on hand, but we don't have enough to complete that project. So uh, approximately 40 million from the bond election is what we will need in addition to what we already have in our water fund to implement that project. It will be uh, implemented as a design build project, uh, very much similar to the way we constructed the original plant. Uh, it is a different uh, type of delivery method that we use compared to what is traditionally done as a, where you design a project, 
then you bid it out, and then contractors will submit bids on it. Uh, we found that uh, a design build delivery is probably the most effective way to, to implement very large projects. Uh, it also has the ability for us to control some costs during the project life. So it is uh, because of the bonds and the limitation we have, uh, it's probably the most effective way to go. Uh, I think there's a question. Um, yes, I wonder what's exactly meant by design build delivery. I may be the only one who doesn't know. Sure. Uh, so uh, start out with a traditional, what we refer to as a DDB project. And that's basically what I had mentioned. It, uh, we usually retain a engineer who goes and designs a project. Then we uh, advertise it for bidding. And then uh, contractors will look at the design and then estimate what it will cost to build it. And then uh, they submit their bids. A lot of people think that's the most uh, uh, cheapest way to do a project, uh, but once you get into very large projects, especially projects that are more complex, uh, it's you don't really get the uh, benefit of having a contractor work with the engineer. So that's what a design build delivery method is. Rather than having one contract with the engineer and one contract with a contractor, we have one single contract that is uh, composed of a team of engineers and contractors working together. So a contractor can actually suggest to an engineer some ways or some changes to a design that would be more cost effective. Uh, you get a lot better communication between the engineer and the builder and you actually have a collaborative effort between the engineer, the builder, and the owner. So you get a lot of, you derive a lot of benefits. You actually get uh, cost estimates as you're going through the design too. So at early phases, if you see that the cost of the project is getting beyond what you believe you can spend, you can adjust the design to uh, control your costs. Uh, that's very different than in a design bid build delivery method in which you get a bid submitted by a contractor. There's really no opportunity at that point to really save any costs because uh, the design has been com completed already. So uh, it is very difficult. And in fact, you end up with uh, change orders generally uh, on the order of 5% is what an, an average cost of change orders is on a, a traditional design bid build project. Uh, on the Nelson Flanders project, we actually stayed within a $60 million budget uh, for the water plant and our pipelines. We actually saved $3 million that was reinvested in other improvements on, on, on the project. So we feel that that's really the, the, one of the better methods to use for construction. Thank you. Another question. Yeah, Larry, this is Todd. Um, one question on the $40 million estimate, have you done like a 30% design of the expansion or, you know, I think usually you do a certain level of design before you bring the contractor on I'm just curious how far along you are in the design and how kind of sure you are of that. Right. Um, that that 40 million would kind of cover the expansion that you're talking about. We, we uh, normally when we're doing planning, master planning uh, work, uh, it's a much more conceptual level estimate. That was what was done in the 2013 master plan. We did an update in 2019, first of all, to, update the, pro the project costs that were identified in the 2013 study. And also, uh, we did a much more detailed cost estimate for the water plant. 
I would say it's generally in the 30% range. Uh, there's several things that have happened over the last five to 10 years. Uh, there, uh, we were starting to see a lot of escalating costs in construction with the amount of activity that was going on. And since the virus uh, has changed a lot of things, there is gonna be a little uncertainty as what that impact is gonna be on construction. That's another reason for us going with a design build delivery method is that because there are some things that are a little bit uncertain, we can identify what those costs, how those impact the design as we're at the 30% design, at the 60% design, and at the uh, final design. So those things we'll know as we develop the project. And Todd, I'd also like to add real quickly that this particular plant um, expansion, um, when the original plant was built, the flock chambers and the said chambers had a, a pipe gallery, basically was gonna separate the other half of the plant so in essence, the, the, the plant was almost designed as part of the first plant construction. We're just mirroring on the other half. And so typically you would be looking at a, a, a new design, whereas in this particular instance, we really are just, we already have a plant there that we're just mirroring. So that, that makes a little bit of difference in this one. Thanks. Hey, Ken, can you hear me, Ken? Yes. Just kind of an unrelated, but a curiosity question. Um, since we treat lion's water for them, how are they involved in any cost changes that we're experiencing now with uh, expanding the plant, if at all? So I'd be happy to let Be Becky add to what this answer, but in essence, for the town of Lyons, for all the taps, essentially they pay on a tap by tap basis. Um, they bought into the original plant that is out there right now for their base water capacity for 80, 90% of the taps they have. And then as each plant, uh, new tap is issued by the town of Lyons, once a year we aggregate that and charge them for the cost um, of essentially the same as a tap we would do in Longmont. You, you pay per tap that's added. And as time goes on, um, as they add new development or new taps, they're actually quite a ways down. They're, they're getting fairly built out. So they don't have a whole lot left to go. But as they go, they'll basically uh, pay for new taps. And so that gets them into the system that helps build that portion of the plant that they use for capacity. And then every year when, they, when we treat the water for them, it goes to them, we do a calculation of every bit of the system. And that even includes things like button rock and you know, our raw water source to get the water to the plant as well as treatment of the water at the plant and sending the water to them. So they pay 100% of the cost of treating their water on a, on a month by month basis as, as that water is treated for them. So yeah, they fully pay for their portion. All right. Thanks, I'll turn it back over to Larry. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> no, no problem. I, I, I don't know if uh, Becky had any more to say, but I think that really- uh, Ken covered it. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, this slide is really uh, to, emphasize that you know a yes vote versus a no vote what the impact would be uh, on, on a yes vote we would have the 80 million dollar bond election the rate increases that have already been adopted would not change and we would be using our existing balance uh, fund balance on a no vote uh, there's no bonds the adopt uh, adopted rates would be would have to be increased from what they already have been approved and adopted by the council and we would still be using our existing fund balance so it does impact 
a no vote does impact the current adopted rates uh, and they would have to rate be much higher than they are currently. The uh, next slide. So again, our arguments uh, for the funding request uh, really avoids the rate spikes and it keeps our rates predictable, uh, distributes the costs between the current and future users, and it makes uh, the needed improvements now. Uh, Short-term repairs uh, would only uh, postpone the need for the improvements in the future, so trying to delay the bond uh, really doesn't save us anything. And in fact, uh, we would be spending money to make short-term improvements that would later be uh, have, have to be scrapped and, and replaced again. So we would be spending more money in that scenario. The next slide. Uh, the arguments against, again, uh, the cost, it's going to cost, it would cost more over time uh, with bond interest. Um, the city should not have to go into debt. That would be an argument against uh, the bond. And um, this is not the right time to spend money. So that could be an argument based on everyone's concern of where the, uh, where we are in the economy right now. And short term repairs uh, could extend the life of the system although uh, we would need to um, make repair or make these improvements at some point. The next slide is really uh, some reference uh, references for getting more information. And that's, I believe, pretty much the end of the presentation. So I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Um, Yes, Allison. Hi, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to do the presentation and lay all that out. And I thought the video was very well done. Um, quick question. One thing that I heard in the video, and I apologize, I'm not gonna be able to get this quite right, but um, one of the messages that I heard was that because of the emergency, this was a particularly important time to address the situation. Um, whereas I heard in your presentation, Larry, the argument being that because of the COVID-19 epidemic, life is unpredictable and now is not the right time. So I kind of heard uh, crossed messages, one going in one direction, the other going in the other. And I was kind of hoping someone could speak to that. Can I uh, Jennifer might be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate that question. So um, you're right that you heard both of those points. And actually, the way that we're trying to put those across, one of the um, requirements of presentations like this that we do is that we do need to include arguments for and arguments against. So um, throughout the video, uh, a lot of the point that we try to make is that are having a quality, you know, safe, secure, reliable water system, clean water system is always important. And it's even more important now. It becomes even more of a necessity during something like this. So um, it's not that the need for, it's not that the need for the upgrades has happened because of COVID. Um, it's not anything like that. It's just that you know, it's always important and we become more aware of it and become more conscious of it during this time. And so saying that now is not the right time to spend the money, those that's part of the arguments against. So that's what someone who is against this bond issue might say. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And I, I completely, I think that those are both excellent points. I guess, um, and I, I apologize, I don't remember them off the top of my head and I thought it was really useful to have the arguments for and then the arguments against. Mm -hmm. I just don't recall seeing both of those on both sides in the video. Right, okay. Yeah, um, you know what? They were, I don't know that there is an, I don't know that there is an argument that says 
it's more important than ever that we make these upgrades because of COVID. But there is an argument saying that it's important to keep our water system clean, safe, reliable during this time. You know, always important, but also during this time we become more aware of it. And then there is an argument, you know, that an argument against would be that people would say, we, we shouldn't spend any money right now. So, yeah. So you won't see them as parallel arguments. Okay. It's not like because of COVID we should, because of COVID we shouldn't. You won't see them that parallel. Um, the fours and against don't really work out quite that balanced on everything. So. And if you want to see those again, those um, arguments, the video and those arguments are on that water bond um, webpage, longmacolorado.gov slash water bonds, water hyphen bonds, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh huh, thank you. Any other questions or comments? The, the one, I guess, that hit me in the presentation that I think needs to be highlighted in my mind is you're really talking about replacing aging infrastructure um, versus the way I was kind of wording it is, you know, if you don't bond it, you may not have the money to do the replacement. So then you're doing repairs to infrastructure that's past its useful life. Um, and then that also plays into meeting regulations. And Larry, I know you had that in there, but I mean, if you kind of boil it down to that, it's, you know, are you going to spend, you know, kind of good money after bad trying to put band-aids on things that are, you know, really past their useful life when you're going to have to replace them anyway, now's the, the time to do the replacement. So um, it just seemed like that, you know, in a nutshell is kind of what it was the take home for me um, in terms of the, the reason for the bond issue. But anyway, any other questions or comments um, for staff on this? Great. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate the, thank you, Larry. And thank you, Becky, Jennifer. Thank yep. you for all your work on this. It lo really looks good. Great. Thank you so much for having us. And if you guys think of more things, you know how to find us. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, we're on to item seven, agenda revisions and submission of documents. Ken or Wes, do we have um, any revisions or submission of documents? Todd, I don't have any submissions. Um, I do have one small revision on the items from staff on the Windy Gap firming project. Um, we had hoped to be able to bring that uh, the actual final allotment contract, but it wasn't quite ready yet. So we, I was just gonna do a verbal update, but unfortunately the um, agenda that didn't reflect that it, it left the wording on there that asking board the board for a recommendation to council we actually won't be asking for a recommendation from to council on when you got firming project allotment contract we'll just i'll give you a verbal update and then we'll come back later with that allotment contract okay thanks, thanks ken uh, next item is development activity which um <clears throat> doesn't look like we have any this month is that right wes that's correct Okay. Okay. Um, on now on to nine A, which is general business, and the first item or the only item under that is the climate action task force recommendation um, comments for council. Um, maybe I can give a little background for Allison's benefit, and I know Renee wasn't um, able to make last meeting. Um, we talked about that and made some recommendations, I think, as the board and the thought at the end of the meeting was we would try to come up with some language after the board meeting that could then come back to, to the board. I, I, I even thought there was some thought it would go to council prior to this meeting, but um, the language is included in the packet. Um, so I don't know if staff, if you want to walk through that in more detail, um, Francie, if you're going to do that. Um, but just a little kind of context of, of what, what's been done there. So, yep. Oh, thanks. Heather's bringing up the, the language. So Francie, or does someone want to kind of walk through that, um, the language, and then we can at that point um, get a vote from the, the board on whether it's adequate or if we want to make any changes prior to going, it going to council. Yep, I would be happy to walk through it. And Todd, thank you again for providing your feedback and comments. Um, we decided we tried to build this section out based on the um, kind of the feedback that was given at the last water board meeting. Um, so the first paragraph is on why the water members present voted um, down on the recommendation. And that was primarily because 
um, the Water Board believed that there was an analysis um, analyses needed um, of environmental, economic, and social impacts um, before kind of stating such an extreme conservation measure, and then kind of highlighted a number of concerns. Um, the second um, paragraph, the water board members felt that it was important to acknowledge kind of the past work that Longmont has done. So we highlighted a little bit of a history of the, when the first water conservation plan was ha passed. And I believe, uh, I think it was Roger who might have told the story about level one, um, how we stayed in a level one drought response, um, why other cities went to level two and three drought response during the 2002 drought. So highlighting how water, um, past water supply planning for Longmont has gone well. Um, and then the last two paragraphs just kind of, requests that in a an evaluation of a more ambitious water a evaluation of the more ambitious water conservation drought response goal and the process of doing that and essentially proposes that staff complete an analysis within 12 to 18 months of city council direction instead of accepting what the climate action task force um, had proposed uh, kind of give staff some time to do a more thorough analysis. And this will be going to city council next Tuesday. Um, I, ha I, I realized that um, I'm, I actually don't know if the city council packet for next Tuesday has gone out yet or not, Heather. I think it goes late um, tomorrow or uh, Wednesday, so we we can get this okay. information. I just wanted to make, make sure before we voted that we there was time for some adjustments for yep. this board. Great, and this this will go with all the climate action task force recommendations and all the advisory board feedback, and so it won't just be talking about the water conservation recommendation at the next board uh, city council meeting. Thanks, Francie and. Allison, maybe for your benefit, the the original recommendation was that we would try to get 35 to 40 percent um, reduction in demands as part of this, but there really wasn't any kind of detail or background proposed. So that, as you can see, kind of plays out in our recommendation of, you know, if you do want to go to that level, we need to kind of prove it up. And I guess with that, Marcia, do you have something you wanted to speak to there? Yeah, I just wanted to add that the um Climate Action Task Force Evaluation Committee didn't approve of this either. The, um, the recommendation was submitted with no analysis um, in support of it other than, um, uh, you know, well, with no analysis in support of it at all, really. I guess, Marcia, one of the questions will be, you know, when it goes to, to council, you know, does the council want to have higher levels of conservation? If so, you know, then we, the staff can do additional analysis. Um, so that, I guess, is what we're asking for maybe the council to come back with is, yeah, you'd like to explore higher levels, um, and then staff can do that work. I mean, um, so it seems to me that's kind of one of the inputs that needs to come back as this goes to council is, do you want to go beyond the 10% savings that is in is kind of codified or included in the current planning? Um, if so, staff can do that and then we can build actual higher level conservation knowing what the impacts are to the different um, kind of aspects, economic, environmental, all those items and then it can be the appropriate level can be determined. But anyway, so it seems to me that still needs to be kind of uh, maybe brought back or um, approved by council. Yeah, um, first of all, Todd, uh, I can't speak for the rest of the council, so they could very well, um, you know, react to this thumbs down by uh, by uh, asking you guys to do more work. Um, <laughs> uh, I did not recommend that having, you know, having been on the water board and, and uh, knowing First of all, the the good experience that Longmont has had with ongoing conservation, uh, and second, 
uh, knowing that um, actions uh, recommended that, that are substantiated by uh, other recommendations will, will have a tendency <laughs> to be conservative of water uh, uh, and, and help the current processes maybe continue to exceed expectations. I don't think that, this, that it's needed at this time. Um, but it's always possible that despite that recommendation and despite the board's recommendation, uh, that the council could vote to do more analysis. So I can't promise you anything um, other than, than if the council votes that way, then uh, I can work to make sure that the recommendations are specific. Okay, thank you. I guess with that being said, I don't, we could walk through or if anybody has any comments or questions on the materials that were provided. Allison, do you have something? Yeah, I did um, a point of clarification. When I was looking through the board packet, I didn't know what the four thumbs down meant. So I have a note to self to ask what that meant. In my, in France, you can jump in here, but we basically had to, I think the, the recommendation of the boards who had to review a portion of the, the task force recommendations had to either approve it, come back with comments, or deny it. And I think we felt like we, you know, the, the proper thing to do was deny it with and kind of qualify that um, of why we were denying it and you know then go back and if they want to give more detail we can react to that differently but that was the reason i think we were more or less we had to make a a re uh, basically a thumbs up thumbs down or i guess they had a sideways vote and we decided to do the thumbs down on the current recommendation for the reasons listed and then say hey if you do want to have a higher level of conservation great we're we're open to it we just need um, to do a additional analysis and figure out what's feasible and what the impacts are. Yeah, that, that was a very good explanation, Todd. And I just want, also want to clarify, okay, when it goes to city council, it's going to say for do not approve so that it's very clear to city council. That's just how we made the voting process easier for the board. Are there any other questions, comments? And then I guess if there's any specific recommendations on the language that was in the packet. So, oh, go ahead, Kathy. So are we saying we want to finesse this statement, which I thought was good, uh, to say that if city council wants more analysis, then staff will do more analysis? Or it almost seems as if we're saying that that is going to happen, that the Maybe I'm not reading it correctly, but it, my interpretation was that uh, that we were recommending uh, more study and analysis, that the Water Board was recommending that. Did I? I think the way I read it and what I remember is, you know, we more or less say if more ambition, ambitious water conservation and drought response goal, if necessary. So if the council believes that's necessary, that will require the you know the necessary analysis of those you know to, to reach that level what measures are required and then what the impacts are so that's kind of what was mentioned earlier in my mind i think we need to kind of go back to the council and and we're willing to do it but they need to define do we need to go to a higher level or not um is i think kind of how but but i understand the confusion so i don't know um Marcia, did you have a, a thought on, on how we do well, that? Well, yeah, I would say the, the task force, um, the, the committee, the Water Conservation Committee of the task force did not present any supporting evidence of why this, um, uh, this level of conservation was necessary. Um, you know, essentially they said the Windy Gap the Chimney Hollow Reservoir will never be built and climate change is happening, which, you know, one is pure speculation and the other one was taken into account by the analysis done um, by the staff and board already. Uh, so they didn't present any data-based uh, evidence for what recommendation that, that they were making. Um, 
I believe that the council discussion already understands that. Uh, and, uh, you know, unlike some other areas where conservation measures can be can be applied, uh, you know, pretty, pretty serious and successful water conservation is going on uh, already. Um, you know, just like a lot of the other recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force are already in the city's sustainability plan. Um, you know, there were recommendations that were presented that are not in the sustainability plan, um, and some of them are fairly uh, aspirational, but they are uh, supported by data analysis from the outside. So this one kind of stands alone as being hard to defend. Uh, I doubt very much that we'll see the council. Uh, um, now that's what I said before. I doubt that we'll see the council ask for additional analysis at this time. But uh, if they do, um, you know, what what I can do is have the facts at hand and and uh, ask them to be specific in their recommendations, and that's the best I can promise. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Looks like Francie this? has something to say. Yep, go ahead, Francie. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if it's helpful. Um, to the last paragraph, it says Water Board proposes that staff complete this analysis within 12 to 18 months of City Council direction. Would it be helpful to address your, Kathy, your comment by saying if City Council thinks a more ambitious water conservation goal um, should be achieved, what then Water Board proposes that staff complete an analysis? So it's very clear. Yeah, that's perfect. That's, I just feel like we need to qualify it a little bit. I'd agree with that as well. Um, Renee, I know, you know, this is your kind of bailiwick. Um, do you have anything you want to add um, on this topic? No, I, I read through the statement and it seemed to cover things very nicely. I actually like the, the counterpoint statement that's available now. Um, I, I get, and this is kind of reiterating stuff that I, I sent along an email to Todd for last month's meeting to the effect of, wow, 35%, that's a magic number. <laughs> um, because that number, it, it isn't terribly realistic to me. And I think that's one of the things that it's important to have a SMART goal. There's an acronym there and I don't know all the parts, but one of the middle parts is attainable. Um, and so an attainable conservation goal is worthwhile. Now, if the city wants to take more action through the, the climate task force, that's great. Um, but I think that that's a case where the existing conservation plan should be the guideline. Um, you know, and so if, if they're like, okay, this is the conservation goal and we want to go a bit higher than that, okay, but it does need to be attainable and this one is not. And I think when you have a, a, a goal, okay, well, conservation's also been working. That's the other thing too. It's, it's not like, you know, conservation's been making these steady decreases in use over the years and that's great. Um, and then if you have this huge unattainable goal, suddenly these great steady decreases are a failure. That, that was where I was kind of like, no, let's not set up conservation for any sort of thing where somebody can point and say, oh, they're not doing it. They are. Um, they're just doing it realistically. I, I did like the thing in the statement where you guys talked about, um, or where Todd talked about affordability too, because if you start really reducing water use, you're going to have to increase your fixed charge, which is going to hit low-income customers in a way that they're not going to be able to adjust and roll with that. Um, I also think from my work with the climate um, action group in Fort Collins, when I was on the city staff there as a conservationist, looking at climate action stuff for the city, water increase was actually one of the possible, I don't want to say goals, but one of the possible side effects of other goals. So, you, you know, you can also think about heat island effect. One of the ways to add adapt to climate change is to plant more trees. Now, I'm not always in favor of planting trees in cities, but when you do that, you actually have the potential of taking your water use up. Um, and I think that speaks to the point where water use is so integral to so many things. 
Um, and so I think we need to also keep that in mind for the task force is that, you know, if you want to make these big goals, there might be trade-offs because the other thing the trade-off is, is if you're going to really reduce water use, you could actually increase heat island effect by killing trees. And that's not good. So there's a lot to it, but I, I definitely support the statement as is. Marcia, did you want to? Well, yeah, that? I just, I just wanted to say some of the other recommendations do in fact get to what Renee was talking about. They don't say plant fewer trees, they say uh, do soil conditioning for improved carbon sequestration, which has a side effect of making plants grow with less water. And um, you, you know, there, there are some conservatory recommendations that don't put us in out at a, an apocalyptic level of consumption, which this would. Okay, um, so we need a, I guess, recommendation to counsel of the statement. I, I like Kathy's recommendation, Francie, you, I think you captured it very well with that additional um, sentence at the beginning of the last paragraph. So I, I guess I would throw that out of, um, if everybody's okay with that, um, if we wanna get a motion to approve the, the statement with that one addition. Does that make sense or is there any questions, comments? Looks like that's okay. If it is, we need a motion to um, approve the, um, the climate action report comments with that one, I guess with, with Francie's language included. I can briefly share my screen if that's helpful as well before the vote. Sure, go ahead. I, does that am I sharing the right screen? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I think so. so it's just this right at the end here. Any thoughts, questions, comments on that? And I cannot see everybody, so if anybody has a thought, they need to speak up. <laughs> I think that looks good. I'd be comfortable okay. with making a motion. Um, to send this on to council with that particular language. Okay. Second. There's a motion is second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, that, that carries. Um, the next item, we're on to item 10A, which is the Button Rock Preserve Management Plan Update. Is Danielle gonna give that presentation? Yep. Okay, hi Danielle. Hi. Um, I don't have the ability to share the document, Heather, because I'm joining you on my phone. Otherwise my screen's too glitchy. So this is the document that should have been in your packet. So you board members should have had a little chance to review it. But if not, I'm gonna just go through it with you now. It's pretty brief um, and, and just kind of remind you of where we are at. Um, so we, we embarked on the Button Rock management plan process in February 2019. And um, it's a two year process. So we hope to finish up the document in December of this year. Um, and the purpose is to gather baseline data of what we have out on the preserve in terms of natural resources, and then just get a sense of uh, visitor use, and then um, to make recommendations um, as to um, visitor use, natural resource protection, and um, all the various things that are gonna go into the plan. So uh, in terms of public process, we have had two public meetings, the first in June 2019 and the second in November 2019 and we're looking at having a third public meeting in October of this year and that'll be virtual where it'll probably be something like us recording ourselves and um, the public getting a chance to make comments ask questions um, and, and facilitating it in that way um, the other piece um, is we are working with three advisory boards so 
you water board as well as sustainability board and the parks and recreation advisory board so we've been coming to you the advisory boards periodically throughout this time um, when we meet when we are at critical junctions in the project and and to just keep you in the loop um, so we've had three public surveys throughout the process process and uh, we just completed our third public survey we don't have um, all the comments compiled so I'm not going to go into the comments but I am going to just give you a sense of what questions were asked and what the public is saying out there so first of all um, and as just a reminder our, our last public survey we had a thousand people participate and this is this is when we had surveys posted up at the trailhead and we had things online and um and then the pandemic hit um for this survey but we still had um over 800 831 people responded online to this public survey so i feel like we still got a really good public response to this survey that we had open for summer so um i'm just going to go through the questions and then we can talk about them so we wanted to know where people were from. 74% who participated were from Longmont. And so none of these questions were required. So not everybody answered every question. So of the respondents, 160 people skipped this question. So uh, to alleviate parking pressure at the preserve, would you ride a shuttle? 72% said no and 28% said yes. And then we are saying to the public that our goals for Button Rock Preserve, as it is a preserve, is to protect our drinking water supply, number one, protect surrounding ecosystems, including healthy forests, so that watershed, the local watershed, and then um, thirdly, to provide limited sustainable uh, recreational opportunities to the public. So then the question was phrased, research indicates that when humans are accompanied by dogs, both on and off trail, their area of influence, including noise, scent, trash, increases, impacting wildlife behavior and movement. How would you feel if a no dog policy was instituted? 64% who answered strongly disagreed, and only two people skipped this question, so everybody wanted to participate in this one. So 64% disagreed with a no dog policy, 25% strongly agreed with it, and 11% of um, respondents were neutral. Then the next question, beginning in 2021, staff recommends eliminating the Button Rock fishing permit and fee. Once in effect, anglers will only need to carry a state license instead of both the Button Rock permit and a state license. Do you agree with this recommendation? And again, only two people skipped this question. 48% strongly disagree with getting rid of the special Button Rock fishing permit. 30 are neutral and 22% strongly agree. Five, visitation is overwhelming the preserve. Staff recommends dispersing use and limiting overall visitor numbers by charging fee, a fee on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Do you agree with this strategy? 55% answered yes, 28, maybe, and 17% no. And then, if you agree with dispersing or limiting um, visitor numbers, what would be the best way to accomplish this? And so then you can see the chart that was presented on the on the survey with the green and the orange. Um, and so we were just trying to get a sense if people would prefer to pay for time that they visit or they'd rather buy an annual pass or they're a senior and they want to buy an annual pass um, or they don't support um, the fee. So 35% wanted to pay per time, 26 annually, another 27 annually that were, would be in the senior category, and then 12 don't support doing this and didn't pick any of the other. Um, and then in terms of comments, um, you can see here the most, num the, the highest number of comments came in about dogs, then hiking, then the fee that we're, we would propose then parking, trails, fishing, cars, and bikes. So um, one thing that I wanna say is I presented this, these findings to um, Parks and Rec Board last week, and um, they had some questions about the, 
fishing permit fee, so question number four. And I, I think um, what's not clear from this question is some of the details uh, behind this. So the, the, the fee, um, the, the reason that staff is recommending eliminating the fee is because we are working with um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, one of our partners on this project, they're on our technical advisory committee, and they are saying if we can go ahead and get rid of this additional permitting process, they'll have the ability and they will stock more, you know, and that would be a benefit to the angling public at Button Rock. And also what's not known in this question is that the fees from this additional permit don't go back into Button Rock. And the other reason staff would be recommending this is just because it is a lot of administrative work for the ranger or rangers that, that work up there, especially for um, dollars that don't go back into the preserve. So, so those are some of the things that went into that and that wasn't necessarily clear from a short question on a postcard to the public. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Are there any questions, comments on the presentation or the survey? Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, how much weight do these surveys give to staff or to council or whomever about, um, you know, for instance, the dog ban or potential dog ban or the fees and so forth? Uh, I mean, I think it's great. It's interesting to see these. Um, but if staff thinks that there's a, um, a, a dog ban would help in, you know, water safety, et cetera, would, you know, I guess maybe Marcia can answer this. What, how, how do you think uh, we could proceed? Well, I can, I can give you an answer, but I can wait. I can let, let uh, Marcia speak first. Um, yeah, I was actually going to offer to let you speak first, Danielle. Um, <laughs> okay. But since I'm speaking, um, I was going to say, Kathy, that uh, I do not believe that this survey is binding on the water board or the council at all. Um, we do public engagement to find out what the public is thinking, but during the summer of COVID, we have found um, that, um, that the public has not been reasonable or prudent in their use of our natural amenities uh, or any of our outdoor amenities at all. And I believe it to be the duty of the board and the council to protect our critical resources whether the public likes it or not. So, um, you know, again, I don't speak for the council when they vote, but I would vote for a dog ban no matter what, if you guys recommend it. So, um, to answer from the, the, the project perspective of the Button Rock Management Plan, if, if uh, Heather, could you share the survey one more time so we could look at question three, please? I just want to say that um, the whole time we've been doing this project and we will continue to reinforce this messaging of um, this, this framework that we're trying to come at this planning process from. Where, and and when, we, when you're at a public meeting, you'll see the graphic and I maybe should have put it in this, but I, I didn't. Um, it's an upside down triangle where the biggest piece is up there on top, protect uh, drinking water. Number one, that is the goal of Button Rock Preserve. That is why Longmont has Button Rock Preserve. And then number two, medium on the upside down triangle would be protecting surrounding ecosystems, the local watershed, the forests, the riparian areas, etc. And then third, the smallest piece of the triangle and the third goal down below the other two is the uh, recreational, the visitor use piece. So we are looking at that within that third section of the triangle, which comes below the other two, right? And so when the public is responding to these surveys and things, it's important that the public gets to voice their opinion, but it's also important and it's our job to make it clear that um, 
this is a preserve and number one and two are the goals, the main goals of the preserve and also additional benefit. We offer limited recreational opportunities at the preserve. So hopefully that, that context helps a little bit. Um, it's something that I wanna drive home to the public and, and continue to work on. Danielle, one question I have. So, you know, Marcia mentioned with COVID, a lot more people maybe out and about in the natural areas. What has happened? I know we had had presentations previously with regards to dogs and some of the issues there. I mean, has it been a lot worse this year given, you know, the number of visitors and the people out there? Just can you give us a, an update so, you know, we kind of have a context of what the sure. current situation is? I can give you some, some anecdotal information um, in just speaking with Miles Churchill, the ranger up there. Um, people have been doing a good job um, um, staying in line with the, uh, the interim dog um, regulation that is one dog per person on a leash with a pickup bag. In general, people have been behaving and following that rule. Um, some of the exceptions to that, we, we have, have had wildlife cameras up. And so we have what some observations that we have seen in the couple of months that we've had the camera up and collecting data and the counts we've done. Um, there, there have been some people just letting their dogs off leash, uh, especially up in the meadow on the Sleepy Lion Trail and some repeat offenders doing that activity. Um, and it's something that before we um, put this rule in place that the public was allowed to do. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't like the rules, so they just, they're continuing to do it, but, but it's not a lot of people. It's, it's um, a handful of people that are doing that and a handful of repeat offenders. Um, and then in terms of what we've seen since the pandemic in general, um, throughout the summer months, especially when things were starting to open up again, so maybe late May and throughout June, we were having a lot of pressure on our parking lot. So we were having the parking lot fill up early in the morning, especially on weekends and even on weekdays, but um, especially on weekends. So we did divert some additional staff up to Button Rock to try and deal with that. Um, you know, and the residents were concerned, the residents that live along uh, Longmont Dam Road about the extra traffic and the dust that was being kicked up. We worked with the Town of Lyons to get signage. Um, Town of Lyons has an Amber Highway sign where they do messaging and they allowed us to share the sign with them for uh, several weekends so that we could tell people when they arrived in Lyons, hey, the parking lot's full, you know, turn around here before making the big long drive into there just to find that out. Um, and we were doing enforcement along the road. So I, I would say the main, the main thing we were seeing is, is, is pressure on the parking lot and, and people wanting to come, come up there. But um, it, it did die back down in July and we stopped putting extra staff up there in July. Go ahead, Roger. You're muted, Roger. A comment on the fishing license thing. Uh, given our concern about the numbers that are coming up there, I, I can't quite understand why we would do something that would increase the number of people coming there uh, versus just leaving things alone and continuing to issue you know fishing license specific to uh, that area that's just that's just my comment i think all that will do is is add to the number of people coming up there so that i just wanted to make that comment i do think that is um a concern that is shared by some of the people that answered that question on the public survey, thinking that if you eliminate that, then you're not controlling the numbers and it's gonna allow more people up there. The thinking behind the elimination was some of the things I already mentioned, the administration time it takes for the rangers when they could be doing other things, the, the money not going into the preserve, working with CPW to um, uh, keep the creek stocked and the reservoirs. Um, but, um, also in previous years, now this year because of the, possibly because of the pandemic has been an exception, we hadn't been selling out anywhere close at all to the permit limit. So it seemed like an unnecessary thing. 
where we would have 500 permits available and we weren't getting close to those numbers. So um, that's just more perspective for you. Okay, thank you. Allison? Thank you. Thank you very much for the survey. That was really interesting. And I just want to follow up on Roger's question about the fishing permits. Um, specifically, is there any issue concerning water temperature um, as far as fishing like later in the day, such that it would cause some stress to the fish? Um, so if there is a concern regarding overfishing, potentially one consideration could be limiting the fishing to the earlier hours when it's cooler. Um, that's an interesting thought. I, I don't think um, the fishing program is top of mind in terms of overuse, but okay. it's definitely something to consider. Um, and maybe David, David Bell, who's here, might have a, an additional comment on that. But one thing I will say is that, you know, after the flood, the, the health of the fishery at Button Rock was devastated, right? And so we weren't having the um, my grown bird, we weren't having the health. We didn't have, you know, the habitat was destroyed, so then we weren't having the insects, so then, you know, the fish populations weren't healthy. Um, and that is starting to come back. Work was done um, in Creek and in riparian areas to improve things, and so we are starting to see some benefits from that. Um, an official study where I give you exact data on that is not part of this. It's outside the scope of what we did in this plan, but um, that's just some information for you. And I don't know, David, if you have anything to add there. I don't, I don't think I do, Danielle. I think on that one, again, I think going back, I'll, almost like you said, Allison, to Roger's question was, um, was that permit dampening the numbers of anglers up there and that's what we were hoping it was doing but we were seeing those permits just sitting there so we weren't seeing those numbers even reached with the permits so having those those permits there as a way to kind of decrease the numbers is we, we saw that as an extra administrative piece that wasn't really achieving that goal because those permits were just sitting downtown not being used so we weren't seeing those, those big numbers we historically used to so that was one of the reasons that uh, we tried balancing the benefit of that along with the administrative costs as well the other piece, Danielle, I just wanted to jump in. I think you did a nice job um, answering Councilmember Martin's question, but the piece I'd throw in there, the public aim to be heard is important, but also is important for Council, I think, to know if there's going to be a discrepancy between what the public's looking for, the direction staff's recommending, and what they're going to be voting for, what kind of work we as staff have to do, what kind of um, staffing might we have to put in place to help get that message out? What kind of work might I have to do through education and outreach? Because if we're on alignment, it's probably a pretty easy change. If there's going to be some resistance, I think it's important for council to recognize that as they make their vote, and then they can direct staff to um, provide those additional resources to help make that change. But to Kathy's point, I, I don't think staff was looking at it as a, a direct vote on how the public, you know, felt we should manage, but that was not what we were looking at. We were looking at to give council information. So as they voted, they know they would understand um, where their, their constituents stood. Exactly. And, and, and is it, yeah, in terms of coming from a, a point in time so that we have this, this data in the future, if we need it as well. Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, is, uh, the, after this is, report is presented, um, is the council going to be asked to give direction on a management or rule change at Button Rock? Or is this just for the information of the council at this point? Um, are you contemplating uh, uh, a change in how, the, how Button Rock is managed? And the other question I have is, is this board, the water board, uh, going to make a recommendation on any rule on making a rule change such as having a no dog rule or limiting the number of dogs or putting banning people who are caught with their dog off leash or from the park i mean all of those seem like reasonable responses um yes we are coming to council and we will come to the boards before we come to council um to ask for um, decisions on various points. We do, um, we do want to we do want to recommend consolidating 
um, the Button Rock Municipal Code and getting it um, in one place uh, in the code. And so we're gonna go through the various points, some of the things you mentioned, dogs, et cetera, and um, make our staff recommendations and then look for council to make decisions on these various points. So yes, this is more than um, an informational document. The, the purpose of bringing um, a draft document to boards and then council is to get feedback and recommendations and then incorporate that into the final plan. Thank you. Danielle, what, what's the time frame on, it sounds like you have another virtual um, kind of meeting or public information and then, so will it be, is it gonna be next spring or something that you, what's the time frame on coming back for recommendations? Um, the time frame is pretty quickly. Um, we this project has suffered since the pandemic in terms of getting the the staff time and attention that it really needs. But the the goal was always to finish this project in December of this year. So that would mean coming back to boards and coming with a draft to council. Boards would be September, and um, the council would be October. But I will. I will say that you know there have there has been some time lost due to the pandemic on this project. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate your the update. That's um, good information. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, moving on, we're at ten B, which is a um, as Ken mentioned earlier. Now is just kind of a windy gap project update, Ken? Thank you, Todd. Um, just wanted to give the board a quick update on the Windy Gap firming project. We actually had hoped to um, have our final allotment contract today, but there are just a couple small changes to the contract that needed to occur. Um, part of that is um, for some of the pooled financing, long months of cash financing participants, so that it doesn't impact us directly, but um, for the pooled financing participants, they're still struggling a little bit with the length of the bond issuance. Uh, some of them want 20 year and some of them want 30 year and um, each side has some really good reasons <laughs> why, why they want what they want. So I, I think that, that final detail has to be worked out. But uh, as soon as that happens, then um, we think we're literally within a week or so of having the final allotment contract ready ready for final review. Um, as such, um, absent anything else, we'll probably come back to the September water board meeting and ask um, for review uh, and recommendation at that point. Um, it's, it's entirely possible that it may come a little sooner than that. And, and I may even ask, um, the chair, if if it's if it would work to have a uh, special water board meeting, um, because we can't take the to to do the September meeting. It's it's the day before the second regular council meeting in September, so that would postpone us till October for the uh, council action. But I think we're probably there with the with the uh, scheduling anyway. But if that changes, we'll certainly let water board know uh, between now and the September meeting. So right now it's most likely that we'll be coming back to the September meeting uh, for a final recommendation on that. As far as the project itself, probably the most significant um, item to report is that um, yesterday, uh, the Division Five water uh, judge signed the state uh, change case or, or the, the decree for the Windy Gap uh, project, uh, as you, and that's probably second only to getting the federal case <laughs> resolved, which obviously uh, we required to be done. But the the state water court case, as you may recall, uh, involved um, really three primary areas. It involved a lot of there. There's a ton of stuff in there, but the three primary areas are. One, that um, the project as contemplated 
um, is acceptable and within the confines of the original uh, decrees. There are a number of decrees for the Windy Gap parent project. The second is that storage of the water on the eastern slope in the Chimney Hollow Reservoir site is acceptable underneath the decree, and that's extremely important. And then the third thing was uh, a line for the uh, connectivity channel around the Windy Gap Reservoir on the west slope on the Colorado River can be built. It can be built um, without requiring mitigation and that it'll basically leave the Colorado River still flows through the Windy Gap Reservoir and this uh, the connectivity channel is just a diversion around the reservoir and doesn't constitute a relocation of the of the uh, Colorado River or um, and therefore requiring a change of point and diversion and all kinds of things <laughs> with the Windy uh, Gap uh, diversion uh, reservoir and project on the West Slope. So really that um, that decree is just, it, it, it's a great huge step forward in the project um, and um, I have, to, I have to really credit um, the legal team at, at Northern uh, Water and the Municipal Subdistrict for moving that, that forward. Um, when you understand how much, uh, how tender and, and gentle those negotiations had to be over decades uh, with the West Slope, um, and to be able to move this project forward, um, it was substantially very little opposition uh, in the state water court. That's fantastic. So that's one more um, thing checked off on our, our uh, case, really kind of highlighting and, and putting the spotlight on the federal case and um, as really the last thing we need to, to move forward. Um, the contractor is, is moving forward quite well on all the pre um, work that needs to happen. Um, uh, and last I heard, they actually had their uh, coffer dam have to build a dam in front of the dam to keep a flood from hitting the dam when you build it. And th th that coffer dam to protect the, the main dam was big enough, it required state uh, engineer's office review as well. So that that is now, I, I don't know if it's been approved, but it's substantially done. And, and um, so that that's good. And basically all the things that the contractor needs to do to, to kick off the project once um, we pull the, uh, the, the plug on and the, you know the federal case is done and we're able to move forward um, is happening so that's um, very good as well so at this point we're really um, uh, just recently um, we're ready to um, order the one main valve that, that it's like a two-year lead time on the valve um, that that was originally approved to move forward last August but finally got the bid from the from the, the firm that builds it's in Germany. Um, it's probably the last of the big things that we'll kind of allow to move forward. At some point we have to think about how much we're spending um, on the pre-work before the actual court, federal court case gets done. So that's probably our next big struggle um, or, or conversation with all the participants in the project. We need to look at that very hard. Um, but really, uh, I, I think we're doing quite well. Um, since we have uh, lowered our participation to 7,500, we have 500 acre feet that other participants can pick up. Um, I have had conversations with two of the project participants who are looking strongly um, at picking up that capacity. Um, we're at the point of we're, we're looking at uh, a, a contract to get that work done. And so I think um, we'll be bringing that with the final allotment contract, we'll be bringing that, those two IGAs um, back at the next meeting with Water Board to review that as well. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that that, that part um, will go, go through and uh, will, will be um, successful. So um, I, think, I think it all seems to be falling into place and, and seems, the, sp the speed and the pace seems to be picking up a little bit right now. <laughs> so, and that's really all I have right now. I'd be happy to answer any questions on the project if there are any. Thanks, Ken. Any questions for Ken? I do not see any. Okay. Thank you, Ken.
Thank you. All right. Um, so we are now on to um, item 11, items from the board. So we have the major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for the future board meetings. Um, Ken or um, Wes, is there anything we need to talk about on in regards to that? I have nothing. Thank you. And I have nothing. Okay. Item 12 is informational items and water board correspondence. Um, it has the prescription take back event on October 24th. Does one of the staff want to speak to that? Yeah, so we got an email about yeah, that, yeah, that, that. I'd be happy to do that, Todd. Go, Go ahead, Ken. Ken. Yeah, um, we just, that's an, we get an email on that date every year. Um, Water boards always ask that we um, put that date out. I think actually a little bit to help us advertise it a little bit. One of the one of the real critical issues uh, at at any wastewater treatment plant anywhere are pharmaceuticals that end up in the treatment process. Probably one of the hardest things there are to take out in a in a water treatment process, and so we really like to get it out to our citizens. And we ask anybody that'll, you know, send the word out, never flush your, your pharmaceuticals down the toilet. If, you know, once you're done with them and, you know, either take them back. Most pharmacies now take them back. Um, um, most of them have take back bins. You can put them in that you don't even have to be buying from them, but also the city sponsors once a year uh, one to make sure that we can take, keep as much of that um, out of the, um, treatment process as possible. So just let, let all your friends and everybody know that uh, there's a proper way to dispose of pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, Heather, did you have something as well? Yeah, just one additional note on that. Because of the pandemic this year, they are doing that as a drop-off rather than as people taking it to the hospital. It will be at Longmont United Hospital again, but they're just doing it as a drive-through drop-off. Okay, thank you. All right, next item is um, items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings, um, cash and lieu review. So we'll revisit that in September. Is that right, um, Wes? Yeah, well, we're planning to bring that back in the, uh, the next quarter in September. Okay, great. Um, with that, that's the agenda for today. Does anybody else have anything they'd, they'd like to say, Marcia? Um, yes, I heard back from Don Quintana and that there is no reason other than the mayor saying no um, that we can't put uh, an additional appointment on the on the next council agenda. So okay. um, I'm going to request that that is, will be done. Thank you very much for, for um, looking into that, Marcia. Um, I guess with that, I'd, I'd first of all I'd like to say thank you and best wishes to Renee um, in your future endeavors. I wish you were staying in Longmont, but I, I get the way it works with the work and family. So best wishes to you. And then secondly, I want to thank um, or welcome Allison to the water board. Um, hopefully you found it interesting. We've got a lot of items going right now. So um, um, hopefully you can <clears throat> stay abreast and um, we'll get up to speed as you kind of go along here. So thank you for applying and welcome to the board. Good luck, Renee. <laughs> And with that, I'm going to, unless anybody else has anything else, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Great. Thank you. Good. Bye, everyone.